Amen. Good morning, you guys. Man, I'm excited about the art of marriage. Uh, my wife and I hosted that at a church in California, and it's life changing. Uh, make sure you guys sign up. You know, we ought to, Chris, we ought to have just single people in there too. Because get it now. <laughs> just get it now. Uh, but I want to encourage you, uh, whether it's the art of marriage or just believing um, in God and marriage, next week uh, we're kicking off a two week series on relation slips. That's what the series is called. Relation slips. It's not just marriage, it's going to be. It's going to be uh, all relationships, roommates, if you want to strangle your roommate or whatever, coworkers. We're going to talk about that. And uh, I am a testimony that Jesus can work in marriages and in relationships. Um, I am of the percentage that should be divorced, no doubt, at this point. The way my wife and I hooked up, that's the, that's the cleanest way I can say it, okay? Um, and we are today celebrating 19 years of marriage. <clears throat> because of the Lord and because I'm winning the fights now. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, it's not too late to get us an anniversary gift. <clears throat> I did have a lady bring me a cake from Dolce. I'm just, I'm laying this out there right now. I'm just, if you love Jesus and me, I'll, I'll just leave that. <clears throat> okay, stranger things, it's fitting. Um, go ahead and turn in your Bible if you have one to Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6, my wife is back there watching the kids, uh, when you do pick up your kitties, throw her a high five, a hug, tell her happy anniversary, she's a great woman. Um, part 2 to Stranger Things, I'm excited uh, to wrap this up and get into our next series, but I'm excited to teach you this, this has been on my heart today uh, and for the last few days, Stranger Things, we're talking about, if you missed last week, Spiritual warfare. How does the spiritual war work? What's going on in our lives? And maybe just maybe the problems we have are not what they think. Uh, maybe marital problems or maybe anxiety or high school problems or parents uh, uh, with problems with their kids or vice versa. Teens with problems with their parents or I don't know, whatever's going on in your life. Maybe there's something more. That's the crux of this series. But today I want to talk about this. This is a very dear subject to my heart. I want you to write this down as we write this, uh, wrap this series up. I want to talk about how the spiritual world uses guilt against you. One of the major tactics to keep you out of the game of life and pursuing the greatness God has called you to is guilt. And this is not just something for old people or whatever. Uh, if you're a young person, we counsel more and more young people here at Frontline, and what I'm finding is behind a lot of anxiety, um, behind a lot of disorders, as we bring, are being labeled, is this thing of guilt. And so I want to take a shot at it. And uh, if there is one place that the enemy, and I'll unpack this in a minute, uses or takes uh, uh, his shots at, it's this place of guilt. Now, we just finished this, this awesome series on vision. On vision. Where are we going as a church? We're, we're, we're getting the building next door for our kids' ministry. We're removing this wall. We're going to expand our auditorium so we can slow down and get to know each other more and uh, see all that God is doing. We're seeing great things every single week. But as I said last week, with every vision, with every great move of God comes resistance. Amen? Just say amen so I, I feel better. Amen. Don't resist me. No, I'm teasing. Uh, but we, we, should, we should expect resistance. Now, let me speak into your life as a pastor a little bit, no matter where you're at. Especially if you're here and you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christ follower, I want you to hear me very carefully. God wants to awaken you more to Him. That's what this is. We don't come here and go to church. We don't come here and sing songs and then bounce so we can start our week and feel good about the fact that we're a conservative religious family or anything else. I'm not trying to beat up on those ideals. But we come here because God is awakening you more and more to himself. We come here because we're becoming less and less asleep to things like love, to things like power, to things like selflessness, to things like healed marriages, to things like a true mission in your vocation of life. This is the object of following Jesus is to become like Jesus. Believe that, guys. I remember when I first heard that, I was so banged up. 
I think I was on probation and uh, uh, probably hung over and I walked into a church and I heard this type of message where Jesus wants to change you. And I was like, man, he better be God because it's going to take a lot to change me. He changed me. He changes humans. In Ephesians 3 verse 20, just bounce back a couple of chapters. Guys, I need you to believe this. I need you to believe this. This is real. Paul's writing this letter, think of like an email, and he's shooting it out to a bunch of churches, and basically he's unpacking what it should look like to follow Jesus. And that's why this isn't like an older person thing. I think young people go like this. They go, well, I'll do the Christian thing when I get a little older and, and work through some other avenues of life. You know, I'll come back to my parents' faith. You need to own your faith now. And uh, if you're 16 years old, this could be your life right now. But if you're 76 years old, this is This is your birthright in Christ. Verse 20, now to him, now to him who is able, guys, God has no problem doing what he's about to declare. Like this is a natural movement of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly. I was walking with this verse this week, and I thought if he would have just said, now God is able to do far more, I'd have been like, dang, that's a great, great thing. But I love what he says. He goes, to do far more abundantly, like as if he doesn't want to cap the thing out. Far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. How many of you guys have prayed some radically, insanely large prayers? It's nothing. It's nothing compared to what God can do. That's an amazing thought right there. According to the power at work within us. So there's this, there's this pull in us. There's this power in us, the spirit of Jesus. And he has the ability to take your marriage further than you've ever prayed or dreamed. As a matter of fact, I think sometimes God does not tell us how far he could take us because it would freak us out with joy. Like if you would have told me when I was 20 years old and I was introduced to him that I'd be preaching the gospel to thousands of people all over the world for almost two decades, I, it would have freaked me out. I would have said, no, I'm going to be a Christian playing Major League Baseball. It would have totally blown my mind. But I, I want you to insert your portion of life into verse 20. Now to God who is able to do far more in your marriage than you've ever prayed or dreamed. Now to God who is able to do far more in your singleness and what you think is loneliness and what he could set you ablaze to do in this world. It's further than you've ever prayed or you've ever thought. Young person who thinks they're too young and they're, they're not seen and they're not valued. God is able to do far more than any teenager has ever dreamed. And whatever remnant is left of a marriage or a life is crazy. I was in pieces when I met Jesus. All you got to do is you got to trust that promise and begin to walk into this thing and hand what's left over. And he does the fish thing, the weird fish bread thing. He'll take what's left and he'll radically multiply What's left into something beautiful, and you call that your life now. Chapter 2 in Ephesians, he talks about just your life personally, your your thought life and how your heart feels. And when you look in the mirror, he's he's able to transform that. In chapter 4, he talks about a church. You know, we get people from the States who hit us up, and they're like, oh, by the way, what's up, Africa? Are people watching in Africa? What's going on? i got to remember that every week. Um, people are tracking with us in Africa, and people, people are excited about Frontline long before I got here. And uh, we're talking about what God's doing here and all these different things we're going to do. God can do far more than we've ever dreamed in this church. That's chapter 4, chapter 5. He talks about marriage. He goes, man, if you think marriage is good now, God could blow your mind. You've not tasted love like I want to give it. If your marriage is not good, he goes, he goes I, I, won't, I won't just heal it. I'll make you best friends more than you've ever been best friends. I'm serious. I, I believe that because I went through it with my wife. He says in your vocation, you think you just clock in and clock out. You think you're just salaried and you're way, you work way too many hours. I could use your vocation and blow your mind. That is the natural, normal Christian life. Do you know that? That's it. And so when you, when, you, when you grab a hold of promises like that, there's going to be resistance. And so no doubt Paul ends this letter in Ephesians 6 by going, oh yeah, all that's coming. God can do all that if you stay focused in the church and you, you stay in the word and you stay in community and you keep growing. But there's, there's a resistance against you, verse 12, Ephesians 6, verse 12. He goes like this, oh, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And you're like, ooh, what's going on right there? I wish, I wish, the, I wish Ephesians would have ended in chapter 3. 
How many of you guys have been in some type of combat sport? I'm not talking about marriage. I'm playing. So there's boxing, wrestling, karate or whatever, anything. Nobody? I want to know who to be friends with. All right. Uh, we grew up boxing. My brothers were high-level boxers, and that didn't really pan out well for me. But um, I, li- I like what he says here. He goes, oh, Jesus has these promises. He wants to move you into a great life. But you got to remember something. You are in a wrestling match. Um, you're in a chokehold. You're trying to be tapped out against who? Against who's this opponent that I'm fighting? Well, it's not flesh and blood. Like Your, your week could have got jacked up this week, but it may not have been flesh and blood. What you saw as a person messing with your life, it may have been spiritual. Guys, what you see is like, I got fired. That may be spiritual. What you see is like, dang, man, what's going on with my teenager? What's going on with my parents? What's going on with my vocation? may not be what you think. It may be spiritual. You ever look in the mirror one morning when you've been having a great week and all of a sudden anxiety just nails you? Negativity nails you? He goes, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And I'm not saying everything is like that. You know, if you have a fight in your home, don't be like, honey, you're full of the devil or anything weird. But he says, have you considered that you could be under attack and it's not flesh and blood? These are the ranks of fallen angels against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Do, do we consider that bowling and the things said on Facebook are spiritual forces at work? There's a spiritual world at work. Spiritual forces want to stop you from reaching Ephesians 3.20, being this powerful person in this world. And if there's one attack I want to narrow in on today, guys, There's one moment in our journey to to grow out of things that we're ashamed of and grow into Christ-likeness. There's one moment in this journey when when this battle rages most. There's, There's a time when you're most vulnerable to the attack. And I want you to write this down. It's when you fall. It's when you fail. And you're gonna fail in the journey. I fail in the journey. When you're trying to learn how to forgive, when you're trying to come to church, when you're trying to go to work and not, not cuss someone out for the first time, you know, and, or, or whatever it is. Or you're trying to treat your teen better or teen. You're trying to get your mind straightened out or whatever it is. On this beautiful journey of becoming the true you, you're going to fall at times. How many of you guys know you're going to fail at times? It's a part of the journey. But, but that is the moment when this spiritual force attacks you most. And it's because if this spiritual force can get you to live in guilt, this spiritual force has you. Guilt is one, look up here, guys. Guilt is one of the most powerful things in this world. And in your failure, if these spiritual forces of darkness can just convince you that what you did is awful and what you did is wicked and you can never be the same person, you've given up the perfect will of God, which is not in the Bible, that you forfeited all of these things in your life, then you'll never walk into Ephesians 3.20. You'll never be the giant you were meant to be. Guilt. And what's so crazy is even when we fall as followers of Jesus, God is so awesome. How many of you guys know God is awesome? And that's not Pinterest junk. God is awesome because God even takes our failures and grows us. But this, this, this warfare wants to convince you that, no, when you fail, God doesn't want anything to do with you again. 2 Corinthians 7, check this verse out. This is powerful stuff for someone here who's battling guilt, battling failure. Look at how good your God is. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, we'll throw it up behind me. For godly grief. So there's a grief and there's a godly grief. There's a bad grief and there's a godly grief. In other words, God wants you to use some guilt and some grief, but just for a moment. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Here's what what he just said. Listen to me. God says, look, when you fail and you fall, it's okay to feel regret and frustration and anger for a moment. Actually use it to fire you up and burn a deeper hate for that sin in you. That's all good. Do that. 
But it can't last long because if guilt lasts too long, it's going to start eating you alive. And he shows the antithesis in, in verse 10. He goes, whereas worldly grief produces death, and that's where this spiritual warfare wants to keep you. Worldly grief that keeps you down and keeps you dying from the dreams and aspirations that God has planted in your hearts. Write this down, everyone. Here's the war right here. Guilt is the most powerful attack on us because our reaction to guilt is always to hide. Mark that. It is always to hide. What is the natural response to guilt in the Bible? It is always to hide. It is always to hide. You can see it in Adam and Eve. What do they do? Uh, when they fell and they felt guilt. Can you imagine that? Imagine being in perfect bliss and for the first time feeling guilt in your soul. And the first thing they did is they, they backed away from God. They hid from God. And, and that's in our blood, guys. That's built into us. Um, when we fell God, which is so often, um, our first response is not to run to God. It's to, it's to run away from God. It's to hide and hold on to those things and mull them over. And that, that's where the, the bullseye is for the spiritual realm of darkness. They watch us. And when we do fall in this journey, as we try our best, this spiritual army against us swoops in and begins to plant thoughts in the minds that look at what you've done. What is Satan called in the Bible? The, the great... What? I mean, I, I shouldn't ask these questions. I was like... What is it? <laughs> That's my fault. He's called the deceiver. He's called the liar. He's called the accuser of the children of God in Revelation 12 or something. The accuser of the brethren, of the sisters. He plants thoughts in the minds that you did it once, you'll do it again. Why are you even trying? God doesn't want you. God doesn't love you. We, we heard a, a young lady testify at our Friday night worship uh, night and prayer night right here on the third row, I think, right about where you were sitting. She just stood up. I get choked up. She, got, she just declared, I thought God didn't want me. I thought I had failed God. I thought God was casting me away tonight. I declare he wants me. I'm his child. He'll never cast me out. That's what happens. Where's my daughter at? She's probably hiding now. Let me get a volunteer. Can I, I can't actually go on with a sermon until I get a volunteer. Is, if Anna's in here, just get up here. I have 18 minutes and 48 seconds. I got to tease my daughter. She's exhausted from the women's retreat, and it's her birthday this week. You can give it up for her. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what you get for being born in our home. <laughs> but I was, I was walking around because uh, I had nothing to do because my wife and my daughter were at the women's retreat. We, us guys get lost. And so I was in K-Town <clears throat> wandering. And uh, I was in a store, you guys, and I was thinking about guilt and how it, it robs us of who we are and it keeps us hidden. It keeps us hidden from pursuing um, boldly things like promotions. Um, it keeps us hidden from pursuing fatherhood and, 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 and motherhood boldly. It, pursue, it, it, it keeps us hidden from pursuing Trying again when we've screwed it up. It just, it has a way of keeping us hidden, you know. It's like if anybody finds out about this, they'll find out I'm a phony. You're not a phony, you're a human. And so I'm looking at everybody, and not in judgment, but I was looking at everybody, and it, I felt like everybody was walking around with a mask on, and it was fitting for this series going into Halloween, Stranger Things. I felt like we all walk around with masks on. We're all pretending on the outside because we're carrying guilt on the inside. And I was like, dang, is anybody in this store, it was Woolworth, <laughs> is anybody in this store being real right now? Are we all walking around with a mask on? And so I, I grabbed me a, a, a one-year-old mask, and I put it on, and I was walking around in the store, and then I thought security was chasing me, so <laughs> I took the mask off. But I just put this on. Don't break it. It cost a euro. <laughs> but... Uh, this is what we're for, all of us, guys. This is what guilt does. It's like we're all walking around with a facade just thinking, man, and, and I just want to rip the mask off and let you be you. And do you know how much energy it is it takes every single day to cover guilt? Do you know how much energy it takes in the soul? 
just look, pretend everything's okay, and instead of opening yourself up to God's grace and saying, okay, I screwed up, but that's not a part of my story, and there is no perfect will of God in the Bible. There's only the redemptive work of the Holy Spirit who takes my chaos and turns it into good and writes a more beautiful story for me. Like it takes so much energy. You know, there's a beautiful soul behind this mask, but she can't be fully present. And when we hang out and we're, we, you know, whatever, whatever 19-year-olds do, uh, I know this is really awkward. We'll talk about this when we get home. Um, <laughs> Like if we're talking and we're hanging out at Dolce and, and, you know, you just can't be you. You can't talk to me and, and be fully present because in the back of your mind you're always thinking, wow, if this guy ever got to know me too much, he would find out about. And like follower of a, followers of Jesus, we fight this, but we believe in God's forgiveness at the same time. It can create a resentful spirit too. You know, the easiest thing to do is is I want to tear everybody else down around me so I, I have some semblance of, of, of a normal life. I want to feel normal, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear everybody down and make them put on a mask as well. And you know what the gospel is designed to do? If you're not a Jesus follower, you know what Jesus Christ is trying to do by, by allowing us to be his followers and, and understand his forgiveness? He wants us to take off the mask today. And some of you guys, go ahead, some of you guys have been wearing masks for a long time. It's time to take the masks off today. It's time to be you. It's time to be free. It's time to let that thing go. Do we believe in our own conversion or not? Do we believe in the forgiveness of Jesus or not? I love Romans 8. You ought to write it down. Go ahead, sweetie. You can give me my, my dollar mask back, but give her a hand for putting up with me. Some of you guys write down uh, Romans 8. I'm not even going to put it behind me. When Paul finally declares who is condemning you, it's not Jesus. I love what Paul says. I read it this morning, and I'll just add this, 1 Corinthians 3. He goes, I don't care what you think about me. I don't even care what I think about me. What matters is what Jesus thinks about me. Who's condemning you? It's not, it's not Jesus. Romans 8 says he sits at the right hand of God. You're declared right. What haunts a heart is what's hidden. Little Halloween for you there. What haunts the heart is what's hidden. And I, I want to today just open up our hearts and whatever we're holding on to in the way of guilt, I want us to lay it at the feet of Jesus and find healing and go free today. So let me, let me give you one point. I want to show you how to guard against guilt. How do you guard against guilt? And this is in every, I used to say this is an everyday exercise for me Then I'm going to show you it's an every hour exercise for me now is that I'm always being attacked by this spiritual force to live in guilt. And I've always got to take my stand and fight back so I stay free of guilt. And I take the mask off and I become the true me. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Let me show you a couple things. You guys good out there? Don't feel guilty for saying amen. All right. 6, we'll throw it up behind me. Watch this. So he says in, in chapter 6, God wants great things for you, but this spiritual force against you is waiting for you to fail so guilt can be spread through your mind and heart and keep you down, so we're going to fight. And so Paul is in house arrest. Uh, talk about guilt. He's been arrested for preaching this message. This message is dangerous. This message is dangerous because it frees 15-year-olds and 10-year-olds and married couples and dads who, whose teenagers screw things up. This message is dangerous because it frees all you from that guilt. And so the forces of darkness through Rome locked Paul up to shut him up. And I wouldn't be surprised if my microphone went out. So in, in 614, he's locked up and he's going, how do I get the church, how do I get followers of Jesus to understand how to protect themselves from guilt when they fell and keep going for Jesus? And he looks over to his left and he's chained to a Roman soldier. This Roman soldier is there for six hours and then a new Roman soldier comes in. And so he's locked up to Paul, which had to be awful being locked up to Paul, <laughs> like especially if you're not a follower of Jesus and he's, he's just unpacking all this great, like he's spitting knowledge and like life-giving stuff and you're just sitting there and you hate your job, you hate Caesar, you hate your home, and there's Paul. He's just like, da, 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 da. you're like, dang, man, what time is it? When's Jimmy coming into work, man? I got to get out of here. 
And Paul's like, how do I get them to understand how to protect themselves? And he looks over and he's like, it's just like the armor that the soldier is wearing. We've got to learn how to protect ourselves. And so here's what's happening in our mind in the negative. Ephesians 6, 14, try to follow along with me. I'm going to move fast. He says, stand, therefore. We just need some steel in our bones, guys. We need to fight. Stand. Therefore, what's the therefore? Because there's a war for your soul. There's a war to keep you in guilt, so stand. Having fastened on the belt of truth, I talked about that last week. Now he goes like this, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. He goes like this, you better protect your heart because when guilt hits, here's what we say. My heart is failing me. My heart is telling me I'm not right because of what I did. Paul goes like this, you better protect your heart when you fail from guilt. He says in verse 15, you better put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Because here's what happens when we fell. We go, I'm slipping. You know, the shoes that Roman soldiers wore, they had like cleats on the bottom so they could fight in mud. And, and Paul goes like this, sometimes you're going to fail and guilt's going to hit you. It's going to be a war on your mind. You're going to think you're slipping and God must be disgusted with you. And, and he's letting you go. He's letting you slip away. And 16, he goes, you better take up the shield of faith. Because our faith weans and, and wanes and, and we say things like, I can't believe God could ever forgive me. I, I'm struggling with my faith. And Paul goes, you better guard yourself from that. When guilt hits in 17, first part, he goes, you better put on the helmet of salvation. You better, you better guard your, your mind. Because ultimately what can happen if you let guilt run its course too long is you'll start questioning if you're even saved. If you're even a Christian. The helmet of salvation. You better protect your mind. You better fight because the exact opposite of, is true. What we do when we fail God and the spiritual forces of darkness hit us with guilt is we try to find our way back to God, don't we? As if, as if somehow we're lost again. And so we get on things that we call the performance treadmill, you know. If you're like me, uh, it's like, let me, let me just read a couple verses of the Bible because my hands burn grabbing it a little bit right now. And let me just read a couple verses. Then that will get like God's watching. He's like, okay, come a little closer. You read my book a little bit. And it's like, you know, maybe you'll pray for, for someone for a few minutes. And then you'll, you'll be like, man, I hope the man upstairs was cool with that one. And like maybe we're getting it a, a little closer. And, and the next day maybe it's a chapter of the Bible. And you're like, oh, are, are, we, are we getting there? And the, the reason we do that is because there's no relationship down here on earth like we have with God. And it's hard for us to fathom that in our darkest moments, God can say, my son has paid for that. Your blood's soaked. It's all good right now. Come on, let's go. In my human relationships, like when I fight with my wife, which we never fight because it's our anniversary. <laughs> we don't fight because I win. No, I'm kidding. Don't tell her that. It's our anniversary. I'm kidding. Um, but, but when I'm fighting with my wife, um, see, the hard thing is, like, if I hurt her, like, that's how we, we do it. you got to ease back into a relationship. You, you can't just be like this. Do you forgive me? Because I forgive you. Come here. Come on. Come on. No, we go like this. Like, you text, you text the one line, and you're like, love ya? Question mark. And she goes like this. She goes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, step one. Yes. And then I'll be like, dinner tonight? She's like, I'm still mad, so it's only paradox. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're, we're getting there. And then you get to dinner, and you're like, hi. <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying. You single people, you just wait. She's like, hi. We think God works that way. Like something broke, and God's just like, how are you going to give this? How are you going to repay me for this one? Fine, let's meet a paradox. And that's not how God works. And that's why this thing is, is, so, is so hard. And that's why when you fail and when you're feeling guilt, and, and I just want to say this with love, I think there are some people in this room who still have not let go of some of the things you've done years and years ago. And your relationship to God on your side is still screwed up. On his side, he's going, I'm ready to make you the giant I'm calling you to be. And that's why Paul goes like this in Ephesians 6, 17. You, when you fail and when guilt sets in, you have got to start an all-out attack on those thoughts and those emotions with the Word of God. Because if you listen to your own words or the, the words of Satan and his army in that moment, you're going to go deeper in guilt. Look at the, the last part of verse 17. 
He goes, and I want every one of you today to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God's. I want you to take the words of God and let Him declare how He sees you in your darkest of times. And what's amazing is the moment you allow God to speak into your guilt, this spiritual force of darkness loses its grip and flees. And that's why He hates this day. And I love this day. Let me ask you a question. When you fell, do you understand what happens in heaven immediately? Like we think of a cosmic angry dad who's just up there kicking clouds or whatever. Like angels are like, dang, man, father's mad right now. You read 1 first, first John 2.1. Read, read all of, of chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 2 of 1 John. It says, hey, guys, let's not sin. Sound good? But when you sin, I'm so thankful that's in the Bible, when you sin, you have immediately an advocate, Jesus Christ, the lawyer, who is making sure you are perfectly forgiven every single second. I will even declare this boldly, that if your relationship with God the Father could drop because you screw something up, God's relationship to Jesus would have to drop because you're in Jesus. Amen? Someone's with me. And that's what the armor is. Our instinct is to hide from God. But that instinct to hide when we feel guilt is not completely wrong. We do need a place to hide. But we need to hide in the right place. And the place is Jesus. It's what he did on the cross. That's where we need to run and hide. And in essence, what he's saying in, in Ephesians 6, verses 14 all the way to, to, to verse 17 is, look, I feel guilt. I screwed it up. I'm being attacked right now. I'm being told I'll never be who I'm supposed to be. I've screwed up my position in the church or all these weird things. And, and what Paul says is, look, guard yourself. You hide, but you hide in Christ. You say, I'm hiding behind the righteousness of Christ. What he did in his life, not what I do in my life, that's what God sees. Paul says, fight like this. I'm standing on the promise of peace, and I'm digging in with them shoes of the gospel of peace. I'm not standing on my own thoughts or what the devil tells me right now. I'm declaring that God says we have peace every second, no matter what right now. I'm digging in. I'm fighting against that. I'm telling myself that message. Paul says, here's what you tell yourself, that you're defending yourself with a faith in the blood that was spilled on the cross, that you're redeemed and forgiven, that nothing can break that covenant, nothing can kill that forgiveness. You're claiming the blood as a blood-soaked child of God. Paul says you don't listen to the voices of the spiritual army of darkness any longer. When you feel guilt, you think on what Christ has done for you and that you're saved and your salvation is not based on how you feel. It's based on what Jesus promised. Write this last thing down. I was walking in the woods yesterday, praying. And I was thinking about guilt. And I was thinking about what the mask of guilt does. When I walk around thinking, oh, who thinks what about me? And what does God think about me? And I was thinking about the gospel, what Jesus has done to, to maintain my forgiveness every second. And in light of what people must be thinking about me and all my guilt and what God must be thinking about me and all my guilt and what I think about me and all my guilt, the gospel doesn't just free you from what other people think about you. It frees you from what you think about yourself. It doesn't even matter what you think about you. That doesn't change how God views you. All that matters is what Jesus says about you. And if you're in Christ, if, you, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior... You are in grace. And the Bible says this, where sin abounds, where sin, sin gets nasty, like, oh, man, I don't even want to think about what I did. Where sin jumps high, grace effortlessly leaps right over it every second. Do you know that? Like, do we get that front line as a church? Like, when you go somewhere else, when you leave here in a couple years, can you please take that, that teaching with you? Where sin abounds, grace leaps effortlessly right over it. I was the fastest kid in school for years in elementary school. High school, I lost it. High school, I played baseball. This is what you do. That's all. That's all you do. You just do this. Every now and then, you do this. I stopped running. But in, in elementary school, I was the fastest kid in my school until this girl moved into our city. 
this girl, man. Recess, we always raced. All the kids raced first. You raced around the, the track, and then you did your thing. And, uh, and I used to always, like, I was like that kid on uh, The Incredibles. Remember that little punk kid? He's like, he's always messing with people racing. That was me, man. I would get so ahead of the other students. I, I would go backwards, and I'd be talking trash. And, and then this girl moved in. This girl moved in. And her legs are as tall as me. <laughs> and her, her mom... Uh, my, her mom was, was a sprinter, and she was a sweet girl. She really was a sweet girl. And she beat me every recess, and the guys would tease me. And this is a little bit like grace and guilt. I would try, and I would grind, and I would sweat, and I would pump my arms, and I would, I would give it every ounce of effort to try to get back to first place until I was just sweating and, and frustrated, and I could never get there. I just couldn't, I couldn't win the race. I couldn't get back in that, that perfect position that I used to run in. And, and every time, man, I'd, I'd be ahead of the pack. All of a sudden, this girl would just go like this, and she'd just always have this effortless look on her face. Just like, <laughs> and that's what grace does. We try, and we, how do I get back in a good standing with God? And grace just effortlessly just kind of winks at you and goes, that's why Jesus died, you're good. And if you say that's too good to be true, no, it's not we haven't made it good enough. This is God. Practically, how do we let guilt go? Well, guilt, guilt loses its power when we confess what we've done, not for God's sake. God's fine. <laughs> He's fine. We confess to God to get it off our souls. And there's something that happens when you say it to God. God, I have done this. I'm not putting it behind my mask anymore. I'm bringing it to the light. I'm bringing it to you. And then we declare what Jesus has done for us and who he says we are. And that is when, in faith, guilt loses its power. That is when the Spirit of God supernaturally begins to heal a heart. Yeah, you need to hide because of guilt. You need to hide in Jesus. And so when those spiritual forces come at you with guilt, I say we stand behind Jesus, and we let the spiritual forces deal with him. Amen? Let's pray. And I'm hoping with all my heart this morning that someone would lay something down for good. That someone would lay something down for good today. You have a destiny. And what's crazy is your damage and your mistakes are actually a part of the story. And God wants to use it and weave it into your story. Because of what you've been through, there are hundreds who need to know that God can still use them. Let's own our stories. Let's claim the blood. It does not matter what others think about you. It doesn't even matter what you think about yourself. It matters what Jesus says about you. I just envision in this room right now, if we could see these burdens of guilt, that they'd be laid in every aisle. All over the floor, we just lay these things down. And we would say, not today, Satan. You've kept me back too long. I'm hiding in Christ. And if Christ is for me, I do not care who is against me. Take a moment and confess anything that's on your heart, any guilt. Just tell God. Tell Him you hate it. Tell Him, tell him you wish you had never done it. Whatever's on your heart. 
but receive from him his words that he says, my, my son, my daughter, in whom I am well pleased today. Christ carried that, that sin. He carried it away on the cross. Rise and follow me. Let him speak to you. Our guilt does not have a chance when we let Jesus speak over us. And Father, we're about to sing this song. I'm praying for deliverance today. I'm praying for some heart to be set free today. I'm praying for people to let go of the things they've carried. We're meant to be lights. We're meant to be like kids, you say. Like kids. Ready to go. And so today we take a stand. We hide in you today, Jesus. Speak the blood over us. In Jesus' name, amen.